It's almost as if it was deliberately designed to look ugly. Until you got inside, you realized how fantastically precious it really was. Scripture, meditating on your scripture. Lord Jesus, open up my mind. Open up my mind, meditating on the scripture. Meditating on your scripture. Something new every single time. And every single time. So last week, <clears throat> we covered chapters 10 and 11. Right? And we saw the first time that God caused Peter to associate with Gentiles, right? And how God had to prepare him for that in advance so that Peter wouldn't turn them away, right? So that something from his past would not prevent him from being able to uh, move forward in God's plan, in God's timing, right? so that God might be able to graft in the Gentiles, okay? But just like anyone, just like anything, God started with his house first. And that's what he demonstrates to us, right? To the lost sheep of Israel and getting his house in order and then being able to spread the gospel and his redemption plan to the entire world. Okay, and so... We saw how God does not discriminate. He does not show favoritism, right? Even though uh, the Jews are descended from Abraham, right? And the Jews, according to the scripture, would be considered God's chosen people. God does not discriminate in, in showing favoritism, right? The only reason that they were considered his chosen people was because he had a friendship with Abraham. And from Abraham, the people of Israel are descended. And so in keeping his promise to his friend, right, we see that God um, continues to work in Israel. And God used the, the nation of Israel in order to bring about his plan to redeem the entire world, okay, to himself. All right, so um, it's a very awesome thing that he was able to start somewhere. Right. And starting with Abraham, having a friend in him, making a promise. Right. And then watching over Abraham's seed from generation to generation. God is giving us a testimony of his own. He is able to watch over your offspring from generation to generation. Right. For those of us who put our trust in him. OK, we will be long dead and gone. And our God still be watching over our bloodline if we prayed for our descendants after us, right? And that's the kind of legacy we desire to leave behind, you know? But anyway, so we see how um, God poured out his Holy Spirit on the apostles. And then when it came to Cornelius and his house, he poured out his Holy Spirit on these Gentiles the same exact way that he did with them. Okay, again, and that was God's way of showing no favoritism, making no distinction, right? And so, you know, it's interesting because we see distinctions being made throughout scripture. There's Jew and then there's Gentile. There's the people that descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. And then there's the rest of the world. And so, yes, we do see the scripture making a distinction, but in terms of salvation, the salvation of the Jew is not greater than the salvation of the Gentile. Okay. And that's basically what the scripture means when it says he shows no favoritism, no partiality with man. If you uh, surrender to the son, okay, salvation will be the same for you. The gift of the Holy Spirit be the same for you as it is for his people, Israel. Okay, and that right there is just awesome. Okay, if you wanted to get into a more in-depth understanding of what that is, you could study the book of Romans, right? Because Paul goes in um, and breaks down in depth, in detail, how God 
worked in Israel, but because Israel failed to keep his part of the plan, that God then opened the door for the Gentiles and the rest of the world, right? It was supposed to be through Israel that all of the world um, got witnessed to, right? By them, through them. They were supposed to be the priests to the entire world, okay? But again, because of idolatry, because of wickedness and sinfulness, right? They fell off and, and, and off the track of God's plan. And so God said, you know what? I got to come down there and do this myself. And that's what we see in Jesus Christ. And thank God for that, you know? And so, but just because the people of Israel, right, had, had been set aside so that God could uh, bring about his plan of redemption for the whole world, Right. It doesn't disqualify them. It doesn't make them any less at the same time. You know, they're still um, equal recipients. Right. Of grace, of salvation through Jesus Christ. If they accept the Lord. OK. And, and our salvation being no different. All right. Very awesome stuff. So that's what we saw last week when Peter ministered to Cornelius's house. Right. And then. Uh, fast forward from there. Um, what else did we see here? Yeah, we see how um, how people at Antioch began to accept the gospel. Right, the church reached all the way to a region in Antioch, and what we're going to discover is that Antioch becomes like the headquarters of Christianity for the Gentiles, the way that Jerusalem was the headquarters for the Jews, right? Um, and Christianity for the Jews. And so, you know, we'll see how God raised up his apostles, 12 apostles for the people of Israel in keeping with his promises. And he also raised up apostles for the Gentiles. And so we see how um, the guy we've been reading about, Saul, who we also know as Paul, and he's later referred to as Paul, um, comes into play in that regard. Okay, and so um, some very awesome stuff taking place. And remembering that it's the Holy Spirit who's responsible for all of these things that take place in the book of Acts, right? We call it the Acts, the book of Acts, right? And it's the actions of the Holy Spirit. Many people refer to it as the Acts of the Apostles, right? And what they began to do after they received the Holy Spirit. But you'll see, you know, all of these events are being prompted by the Spirit himself. And so it's very awesome. <clears throat> All right. And that way, so that no man can take glory for what is being done, but only God and all praise be to God. All right. And so tonight we're going to move forward through the book of Acts. Right. So for those of you who might be tuning in for the first time, the book of Acts is the fifth book in the New Testament. So you'll have the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, and then the book of Acts. Right. And so it's kind of like a continuation of the book of Luke because it's written by the same author. Okay, and so his style of writing would be the same, even though he's guided by the Holy Spirit and what to say. All right, and so today we'll be picking up uh, chapters 12 and 13. All right, and so... The book of Acts, reading out of the NIV, starting at chapter 12, right from the top. Okay. Before we get into the word of God, we're always going to come in prayer to the Father and ask him to guide us. So right now, we're just going to bow our hearts and ask God to be with us as we study his word. All right. So let's pray. Holy Father, we come to you in Jesus' mighty name. And Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you for allowing us to make it to this point in time 
where we can study your word, where we can learn more about you, where we can find our purpose and meaning in this life by studying your words. Father, being uplifted and encouraged by everything you desire to show us and teach us. I pray that everything that we learn, that we you write on our minds and on our hearts, Father God, that we can draw from these things so long as we draw breath into our lungs, Lord. Father, I pray for each individual um, who's here tonight. I pray that you open their minds to the scriptures, Lord God, so that they can be filled with everything you desire to, to speak to them and for them to know that they might be encouraged and mature in their faith and, and growth, Lord. Father, I thank you for being our teacher, for being our guide to your scriptures, Lord, and, and we wouldn't have it any other way, Father. We know that no man is perfect. All men are liars, Lord God, when they stand next to you. So, Father, we ask you to be our teacher. You guide us through your word. And, Lord God, we invite you into this place, Lord God. We, we ask your forgiveness for our sins always, Lord, knowing that we will always be dependent upon you for your atonement, Lord God, for your cleansing blood and mercy. So, we ask your forgiveness for our sins. We give you all the glory and honor in this time. All these things we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right, y'all. Book of Acts, chapter 12, right from the top. So it says, It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. Right. Remember, King Herod would have been the king that's installed over the people of Israel by the Romans. OK, that's typically what a Herod was. It's the title of the king who sat on the throne in Israel on behalf of the Roman people. OK, and so they would have had their own puppets in play. So verse two, it says he had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword when he saw that this met with approval among the jews he proceeded to seize peter also okay and so remember when we started studying together we went through the book of john well this guy james is the brother of that john who wrote that gospel right so throughout the gospels he's referred to as a son of thunder along with john um, and these were, in a way, cousins to Jesus Christ, okay, through their relations to the, through the parents, all right? So anyway, so now when the king puts to death James, by the way, he's the first of the Lord's apostles here to be killed in scripture, right? And then you're not going to see any of the other ones in scripture being martyred. But if you do your research in church history, you'll see that all of them were martyred, okay? And um, they even tried to kill John, and there's some funny business that happens with that. They tried to boil him in oil, and it didn't work. So instead, they exiled him to the island of Patmos. But anyway, all of them were persecuted for their faith and their uh, testimony to the word, right? So... Uh, James being the one who has the honor in scripture to lay his life down for the Lord. Praise God for that. But now that this king sees that the, the Jews are happy with this, right? He starts to go after Peter also. He's like, oh, well, let me go after the leader of the resistance at this point, right? So he says, this happened during the festival of unleavened bread, okay? After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each, okay? And so imagine a 16 dudes, right? Who had to watch over this one guy. You could imagine their anticipation of people probably trying to break them out. They had no idea what Christians were like, <laughs> right? As harmless as doves is what we're supposed to be, right? They expected that there might be a riot or, or something from the people. So anyway, it says, Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. Okay, so, so now we have, obviously, there's been time since the 
the last Passover, which we saw where Jesus was crucified. Okay, now we're at this um, festival of unleavened bread. And, and again, I think we may have mentioned last week what that is, but the festival of unleavened bread, what leaven does in bread is just, it's like adding yeast to bread. It causes the bread to puff up, right? And so um, what God did was he commanded the people not to eat bread with yeast in it, okay, as a symbol of uh, keeping away from sin, a sinful, prideful nature, okay, because, because leaven puffs up, yeast puffs the bread up, um, God didn't want us to put uh, pride in our bread, he wanted us to eat flat bread, right, which was considered to be without sin, okay, flat bread is, is again, one of those illustrations on earth, a uh, 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 physical element that represents something without sin, Okay, not puffed up, basically. So anyway, God had a festival for all, all these things, and they all point to Jesus Christ in some way, shape, or form. So if you wanted to do a study on the festivals, that it, I mean, you'll have a lot of fun doing that. But anyway, so, so now we see Peter is being guarded by 16 soldiers, right? It says, verse 5, So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. All right. So imagine, you know, you're passed out in a dark cell up against the wall and some angel just hits you <laughs> to wake you up right and and wakes you up and so anyway it's just it's funny to me because i could imagine what peter was thinking when he opened his eyes and he saw this guy right so it says then the angel said to him put on your clothes and sandals and peter did so wrap your cloak around you and follow me the angel told him peter followed him out of the prison but he had no idea what the angel was doing. I'm sorry. Yeah, what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. Okay, so here, this guy still thinks he's asleep, right? All right, so they said, they passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Okay, and so now take these things into consideration. The, 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 the shackles just fall off Peter's hands. They get to this gate. It opens by itself. All right. And so, you know, none of us can really pretend to know what is the extent or limit of the power of angels, angelic beings. OK, or perhaps there were other angels who were doing those things that he could not see. Right. It appeared to open by itself. There were other angels in the spirit realm who were moving those things for him. And but God only allowed him to see the one angel who was instructing him and leading him. Right. So, I mean, you could basically just try to use your imagination for what's really going on. But again, for us to put our finger on that, it's just like hit or miss. So. But it's a good thing to, to take into consideration when pondering the power of angels, the power of God, right? Never put a limit on the power of God. Do not treat him as a finite, right, deity or, or being, okay? Um, because, again, he surpasses all of understanding. You will never be able to know. He has no limit. You cannot exhaust him. He's inexhaustible, right? God does not get tired. He does not sleep and so on okay and so how awesome it would be when we see these things for ourselves right all right so anyway it says uh verse 11 then peter came to him to himself and said now i know without a doubt that the lord has sent his angel and rescued me from herod's clutches and from everything the jewish people were hoping would happen okay and so if he Killed James with the sword. I'm pretty sure he was getting ready to have 
some evil fun with Peter, right? And so when this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark. Okay, so now this is another John, right, whose, whose surname is Mark. We, we know him as John Mark. This was Peter's little cousin. Okay, it says um, he went to, to his mother's house, uh, Mark's mother's house, right? It says where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the outer entrance and a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. Okay, and so again, if this was a scene from a TV show or a movie, that would have been absolutely hilarious, right? You see this guy at the door after, I mean, you guys are in deep prayer, praying for his welfare. You go to the door, you see him there, and you're just so excited, you run back to tell everybody you don't even let the guy in, okay? Very funny. So anyway, that, that's the human element in the story, right? So it says, when she um, when she recognized Peter's voice, so I said that already, sorry. 15, it says, you're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. He said, but Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Okay, Peter motioned with his hand to, for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Okay, and so I think the most interesting part there in terms of commentary is like, what did they mean by it must be his angel, right? Okay, and so again, whatever these people may have believed in, could have been some um, form of superstition where they believed that each of us have angels. Maybe they referred to his spirit. Maybe it was his spirit coming to see us. Um, or maybe he had sent a messenger, right? Because the word angel also means messenger. Okay. And so, um, you know, but exactly what they meant by that, you, you would have to do your own research into that, right? Okay. And so, so he tells them uh, how, how this whole thing went down, right? He said, tell James and the other brothers and sisters about this, he said. And then he left for another place. Now, obviously, we know he's not referring to James, the brother of John, because that brother was martyred. He's referring to the half brother of Jesus Christ, who was um, in charge of the church in Jerusalem. OK, it was one of those brothers of Jesus that didn't believe initially who came to faith after the fact, all right, and then became one of their prominent leaders in Jerusalem over the Jews, okay? So he, he told them, tell him, you know, the other brothers and sisters, uh, what went down, basically. All right, it says, in the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. After Herod had a thorough search made for him, and did not find him. He cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. Okay, and so I know we had made a mention of what it was like for soldiers in that day who were commissioned to guard prisoners. If your prisoner was sentenced to 10 years and he escaped, that soldier had to uh, give up 10 years of his life to serve the rest of that man's sentence. OK, and so this is why it was paramount for guards not to allow prisoners to escape. They would have gone uh, the full measure of searching for this guy, uh, even putting other people to death who would get in their way to try and find this dude, because otherwise they would have to serve the sentence. So in this case, Peter would have most likely have been sentenced to death. So because these 16 guys allowed him to escape, Herod examined them and then ordered that they be executed. 16 dudes would have lost their life for allowing this one guy to escape. That's brutal. But again, it would teach every other soldier on the force not to allow anyone to get away, right? So it was good, good government, good practice in, in that sense. 
Okay, so it says, Then Herod went from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. He had been quarreling with the people of Tyre and Sidon. They now joined together and sought an audience with him. After, after securing the support of Blastus, a trusted personal servant of the king, they asked for peace because they depended on the king's country for their food supply. Okay, Tyre and Sidon is what we would now know today as Lebanon. Okay, which I believe is north, due north of the, the nation of Israel. Okay. And so, again, if anything um, traveling into Israel from, from up there would have been a vital um, road or route to get things in or out of, of particular regions, right? And so, um, they have a long history with Tyre and Sidon. You could study, um, you know, uh, Solomon's relationship to a king uh, from from Tyre, and also if you study the book of Ezekiel, see how God um, his brings his judgments upon that land for things that were going down. But anyway, just to give you an example of um, the history of that land, right, with the people of God. Twenty one on the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. They shouted, this is the voice of a God, not of a man. Immediately because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down and he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God continued to spread and flourish. Okay, and so again, because this king was in charge of the nation of Israel uh, over God's people, okay? When he did not correct the people for calling him a God, but, but tell them, no, there is only one God. He's been the God of, of your nation since the beginning, right? Because he did not correct them, an angel struck him. And, and here's the thing. This is not the only time that this has happened. Through it's several times um, throughout history this has happened, even in our modern times. Okay, you'll see people who are in charge of Israel who are treated in such a way where they don't give glory to God, but blaspheme them will end up having a stroke on the podium, right? And, and again, for me, I like to see it like one of the angels was standing there and just knocked him out and he died, you know, and that's it for him, right? So... But anyway, um, I mean, just think about that, right? Like, if you're in charge of God's people, you better give glory to God. Especially if someone tries to treat you with greater honor, you know, um, than any man is due. Uh, you, no man should be referred to as a God, right? So, verse 25 said, When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. Okay, and so now, moving on from Peter, we're going back to our friends Barnabas and Saul, um, and now adding to their ministry, this guy Mark, right? Again, which we know was related to Peter, he was also related to Barnabas, okay? I believe Barnabas would be his uncle as well. All right. So this Mark, John Mark, is responsible for the gospel of Mark, okay? And that gospel would come about uh, through Peter's eyewitness testimony, right? So Peter would have um, already had works completed, right? That he, he may have been already writing um, his, you know, things that he experienced with the Lord, but died before they were able to be put out in circulation. And so what happens is um, after Peter's death, Mark takes up that that gospel um, and, and writes it in Greek and then puts out the things that Peter had witnessed um, through the gospel. So very awesome stuff. All right, but you can see how these players got involved in the game, everybody taking up whatever things the Lord had set up for them to do, right? God tells us through the, through the New Testament, 
right? He has prepared works for us to do in advance beforehand, before the foundation of the world, right? Before he called any one of us to faith, there was already in his heart, he had determined what things we ought to do, okay? He had already predetermined, you know, that you would be one to hear the gospel and, and then it being up to you to accept it and to be obedient to it and walk according to the faith, right? And so chapter 13, it says, Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon of Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menane, who had, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Okay, and so people from different regions, right? Gentiles from different places now becoming prophets and teachers in the body of Christ. Okay, and what would be known, again, Antioch, like um, a major headquarters, okay, for the church uh, in the Gentile world, right? So God letting us know who were, who were the prophets and teachers of that particular church, Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius, Menane, and Saul, all right? And so this guy, Menane, even being brought up together with the Herod, Herod the Tetrarch, right? The one in charge. And so that's pretty interesting. Somebody who is considered to be close to the king, okay? Becoming a person of faith. And it just goes to show, you know, the extent of God's hand. He had mercy on, on everyone, high and low far and wide okay and so that's just awesome just absolutely awesome not getting caught up in the politics that's the hardest thing for people of prominent position and dignitaries and those in charge of of the state and so on right it would be very difficult for them to come to faith in christ because it's absurd to the world and then to actually be obedient to him it's like contrary to the nature of all the people, the politicians and, and the, the people pulling the strings, okay, and doing all kinds of shady dealings under, under the table, you know, these people of faith um, holding it down, right, so verse 2 it says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Okay, and so again, seeing the Holy Spirit's involvement, right? And him taking that, that lead role and saying, look, I'm doing this thing here. I'm calling these guys to do this work, set apart those two, okay? So the rest of you guys could be in here praying, fasting, helping the community, whatever. Barnabas and Saul, I got something specific I need them to do or I want them to do, period. Okay, and so again, how did they come to uh, hear from the Holy Spirit and be able to determine what his will was? They were praying and fasting, worshiping the Lord. Okay, and so a lot of times you'll find that when you're worshiping the Lord and you're fasting and engaging in prayer, that God will speak to you. Okay, and he'll, he'll maybe he'll show up in your dreams, right? He'll 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 come through way of maybe a prophet who will speak a word from God to you, right? Or other ways, things that you've prayed for, you'll see them come and be answered. And then don't forget the Holy Spirit's ability to speak to you directly, okay? And not putting those things to the side and saying, oh, that's supernatural stuff don't happen in the church anymore. That's not true, all right? Okay, so anyway. Um, and so it says, after they fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. And again, we see this laying on of hands. They had the full support of the church remember when the scripture says where two or more come together where they gather together in agreement with something right and basically they they know the will of god is moving through all of them and they can determine that because they're all in agreement and in unity right and then just like when it says when a person is sick okay among you have the elders come lay their hands on him and if he sinned he'll be forgiven and he'll be healed 
from his sickness. All right. This is one thing that I don't think we do enough. Okay. In, in the body of Christ is um, fasting, praying and laying on of hands and, and functioning and working and moving and maneuvering this way, the way that we see the Holy Spirit causing these people to move in the past. You know, I think that um, there definitely needs to be some revitalization um, and rebirth of these things in us, right? Having confidence that God is moving with us and in us and through us, okay? So anyway, it says, the two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. Okay, and so remember also, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile, right? What God did was he working in his own house first, right? Just like the scripture tells us, like, who are we to start going out to the whole world and doing all this stuff when we didn't even do it in our own homes to start with, right? The ministry begins at home first, okay? And so if we if we have a good ground with our family, we've established, you know, um, the gospel with them, teaching our wives, our children, right? And, and whoever else, our, our parents, our siblings, and so on. And then... Once we've exhausted the gospel there, whether they receive us or not, we go out and, and minister to, to, the, to the rest of the world, right? Now here, these guys would start in the synagogues first, okay? And again, when you go to a place where the word of God is already established somewhere, the chances of your being able to convince people that the Messiah has come be greater than just starting from scratch, right? So when if you won the Jewish community over in the synagogues that they had established in the Gentile territories, if you won those people over, you would have their support in now spreading the gospel in that region and territory. And then when you leave, those people will be the ones to keep it going. Okay. And so there was um, a wisdom in doing that, right? Hitting the synagogue first, you know? All right. So verse six, it says, they traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar Jesus, right? Remember we talked about Bar Abbas, right? Meaning son of the father, right? Bar means the son of and Abbas means father. Now here we got a guy named Bar Jesus, right? This guy's name would be son of Jesus, okay? And again, a sorcerer. Now, it's funny how earlier we see Peter encountered a sorcerer named Simon, and we saw how that encounter went. Now we see Paul, right, and Barnabas encountering a sorcerer. Let's, let's take a look at what happens here. Okay, so this sorcerer was an attendant of the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, okay? A proconsul is like somebody who is in is put in charge of a country a particular region on the behalf of the king okay and so this guy would rule over the territory as if he was the king with all the authority of the king okay a proconsul was a, a very um high position uh, of the people right so this guy would have had um a lot of pull in this territory okay and so he had a sorcerer as an attendant so imagine that the proconsul an intelligent man sent for barnabas and saul because he wanted to hear the word of god could you imagine you know if somebody called you like the mayor of your town the governor of your state you know the president of the nation like wants to hear the gospel from you, you better be ready, right? But anyway, it says, but Elemis, the sorcerer, for that's what his name means. All right, so now we have what his name was, Bar-Jesus, and now them giving us um, a surname or, you know, his, his uh, uh, what do you call it? Like his, his, his translated name, right? 
Elemis. Okay, it says he opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Okay, and so immediately you see there's resistance from a sorcerer. Okay, and we, I think we can kind of put the pieces together on that, right? It says, then Saul, who was also called Paul, okay, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elemis and said, you are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Okay, and so real quick, take a look at some details here. This is the first time that we're seeing Saul referred to as Paul. And from now on, we're, we're only going to see him referred to as Paul. Okay, and so whenever you hear in the church someone's making a reference to Paul or the letters of Paul in the New Testament, okay, Paul becomes one of the most famous guys in the church that we ever knew, right? And uh, anyway, here's where you see he has this name change, right? Saul to Paul. And basically, it's going from his Jewish name to his Roman name, his, his Greek name, okay? All right, so being filled with the Holy Spirit, which basically means like the Spirit was egging him on to say this to this guy, called this dude a child of the devil, right? We know not every enemy of God is considered a child of the devil, right? There's some people who, you know, they just resist the Lord, you know, and 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 um, just enjoy the darkness or whatever for a time, and then they might come to the light. But here we see this guy being referred to as a child of the devil. The same way Jesus referred to the Pharisees and Sadducees, okay, of his own people. He said, you are a brood of vipers, right? Like children of snakes, right? He said, you're, you're liars, murderers, because you're trying to murder me. All these things, right? Children of the devil. And so that's a pretty strong uh, rebuke, right? And so what happens? The Holy Spirit strikes him with blindness for a time, okay? And so, um, so it says, immediately mist and darkness came over him and he groped about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. And so again, for some people, they came to faith by seeing some grand miracles, miraculous signs and wonders performed. This guy came to faith by seeing his attendant get spanked by God, which is, again, pretty awesome, right? Sometimes it's got to be that way as well, right? You see God do an awesome thing and God do a terrible thing. Either way, you saw God do it and you came to faith because of it. It's very awesome. <clears throat> But imagine that being part of your testimony, you know? Yeah, I came to faith because I saw this guy heal another guy. Yeah, I came to faith because I saw God strike my servant with blindness. That's absolutely hilarious. All right, so it says, From Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in Pamphylia, okay, where John left, left them to return to Jerusalem. It says, from Perga, they went on to Pisidian Antioch. Okay, it's a different Antioch, right? So we're talking about the Antioch um, that we that we were previously mentioned. This is uh, just a, a due north of Israel, right? And then as you wrap around the Grecian territories to the north, you'll see um, above... Uh, I'm trying to remember the other territories there. I think it's like in Galatian territory to the north of that is where we're going to see this other Antioch come into play. So don't get those two confused, right? <clears throat> but anyway, remember, we see how Barnabas and Paul are being sent to the Gentile territory. So that's where we're at. All right. But now there are synagogues, the Jewish people scattered all throughout the Grecian territories. And so that's the reason we see synagogues out there. Right. So it says on the Sabbath day, they entered the synagogue and sat down. 
After the reading from the law and the prophets, the leaders of the synagogue sent word to them saying, brothers, if you have a word of exhortation for the people, please speak. Standing up, Paul motioned with his hand and said, fellow Israelites and you Gentiles who worship God, listen to me. The God of the people of Israel chose our ancestors. He made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt. With mighty power, he led them out of that country. For about 40 years, he endured their conduct in the wilderness, and he overthrew seven nations in Canaan, giving their land to his people as their inheritance. All this took about 450 years. Okay, and so, again, you can go back and see how God told Abraham he was going to allow his descendants to be slaves in a nation, not their own, for 400 years. All right. So very deep stuff. And then what took place after that, right? When God brought them out, they spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness, learning who God was, right? So now it says, after this, God gave them judges until the time of Samuel the prophet. Then the people asked for a king. And he gave them Saul, son of Kish, the, of the tribe of Benjamin, who ruled 40 years. After removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. Okay, and so again... Even though God had installed one king, this is, and that's in the book of Samuel, if you guys want to get into that, you see how when Samuel was the prophet of the people, he told the people, God is your king. But the people said, we want to be like other nations. We want a king that we can see. And it kind of, it hurt God. It, it broke God's heart. And it hurt Samuel also. And so God said, you know what? Let them have what they want. Okay. And then God um, showed them who their king was going to be, the king that they would have chosen. This guy was tall, he was handsome, right? And he would have been a great leader for them. So anyway, it turns out he wasn't such a great leader. And God installed another king, a king that he chose for himself. And that's the guy we're referring to here, David, right? So now it says, verse 23, from this man's descendants, God has brought to Israel the Savior, Jesus, as he promised, right? So God promised David that he would never lack a man on the throne, right? And so um, he told him basically the Messiah, the Savior of the people, the Savior of the world is going to come from your bloodline, from your descendants. Okay, 24. Before the coming of Jesus, John preached repentance and baptism to all the people of Israel. As John was completing his work, he said, why do you suppose, oh no, I'm sorry, who do you suppose I am? I am not the one you are looking for, but there is one coming after me whose sandals I am not worthy to untie, okay? And so now that's John the Baptist's testimony of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, right? His sandal straps, I'm not worthy to untie. Okay, and so when we read the word of God, you're going to come across the Jewish culture and a lot of cultural things, right? Um, this particular rendering about untying the sandal, okay, it was part of a ceremony whenever someone could not uh, take up for his brother, okay? The, um, what responsibilities his brother was not able to fulfill. If your brother died, then taking up his land, taking up, uh, if, you, if you didn't have a wife, taking up his wife in marriage so that you may bear children in his name to keep his name alive on the earth, okay? Um, taking up the responsibility of your brother's uh, things, okay, was part of the law, part of the culture of Israel. And if you could not do that, what happened was you basically disgraced yourself and 
the, the, the leaders of the people would come, they would remove a sandal from your foot because you were unworthy. You would, you would be made to limp around all day and everyone knew this guy, you know, disgraced his family name. He didn't, he couldn't keep um, his brother's name alive on the earth and so on. Um, and it was far worse than that. They spit in his face, they would punch him, you know, and, and other things. But anyway, but now John is saying, now nah, Jesus was able to, he was able to keep God's name alive on the earth, right? He was able to uphold all that Adam lost in the garden. I was not unworthy. Uh, I'm sorry. I was not worthy to untie the sandal from his foot. So it's a, a pretty deep thing to say. All right. You could get some details from, from the book of Ruth. If you study Ruth, you'll see where, um, they have the right of the goel and all of that stuff that, that goes on with that. So it's very interesting. All right. So um, it says 26, fellow children of Abraham and you God-fearing Gentiles. Right. So now Paul's basically laid down the groundwork of his sermon. Right. Remember, let's, let me bring your attention back to these things. God started here. He moved on to here. Now we're here. Right. Okay, so now, now that I got us this far, okay, fellow children of Abraham and you God-fearing Gentiles, it is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. The people of Jerusalem and the rulers did not recognize Jesus, yet in condemning him, they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath, okay? So, it says, though they found no proper ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed, right? So even apart from their knowledge, still fulfilling God's plan, right? Very awesome. When they had carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days, he was seen by those who had traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to our people. We tell you the good news, what God promised our ancestors. He has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. As it is written in the second Psalm, you are my son. Today, I have become your father. God raised him from the dead so that he will never be subject to decay. As, as God has said, I will give you the holy and sure blessings promised to David. So it is also stated elsewhere, you will not let your holy one see decay. Now, now when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep and was buried in his ancestors, I'm sorry, with his ancestors and his body decayed. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. Okay, and so other words, in Psalm 2, there was no way that that psalm could be referring to David himself. Because David is buried and, and saw decay. So who was the prophet referring to? Jesus Christ, who did not see decay. Right? So remember, all the scriptures talk about Jesus Christ. All right? And it's, it's our joy and pleasure as we study to see those things to find them out right very awesome stuff okay and so basically um paul giving these people the gospel right delivering the business right think about this remember that paul himself was not um an eyewitness to all of those things he was not one who followed the lord and walked after him he was born after the fact, even after murdering a Christian, right? This guy then has his encounter with the Lord. And a lot of things we're going to come to see as we study through the gospel, I mean, through the epistles. Um, Paul learned directly from the Lord in his own personal encounters. That's some very awesome stuff. So keep that in mind. Anyway, so he says, Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. How awesome is that just to hear? Like, 
You mean to tell me I could be forgiven for every sin I've ever committed? How unworthy and undeserving we are. And yet, for those of us who trust in Jesus, right? This is what's given to you. This is what's given to us, okay? Very awesome. I mean, that's, that, that's grace on top of grace, right? So 40, he said, take care that what the prophets have said does not happen to you. Look, you scoffers, wonder and perish. Or, yeah, want, no, wonder and perish, right? For I am going to do something in your days that you would never believe, even if someone told you. How wild. As Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. And so when the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who talked with them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. So very awesome. They were received and seems to be apparently well, right? It says, on the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy, okay? And so now, again, imagine, he's again, he's in a Gentile territory, and there's some hardcore Jews that are still not willing to let go of the old stuff, right? Hating, hating, because now everybody's drawn, right? Every day in the synagogue, they preach, and they don't get such a good turnout, right? All of a sudden, Paul and Barnabas show up, and they sold out seats, all right? And you, you can't even get tickets for the event, right? It says, they began to contradict what Paul was saying and heap abuse on him. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly. We had to speak the word of God to you first, since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life. We now turn to the Gentiles, for this is what the Lord commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And so again, now that these men have dealt with God's house first, right, the Jewish people, and they did not receive them, they wash their hands of them, and they move on, okay? Now it says, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord. And all who appointed for eternal life believed, right? All who were appointed for eternal life believed. It says, the word of the Lord spread through the whole region. But the Jewish leaders incited the God-fearing women on high standing and, and leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. So they shook the dust from their feet as a warning to them and went to Iconium. It says, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Again, remember when these guys suffered persecution, they knew that they had been counted worthy to suffer for their Lord. That was an honor, okay? And so it, and it basically meant that they were doing the right thing, that all the scriptures that uh, had been spoken about those who would serve God, who would suffer to serve him, are coming to fruition, being fulfilled, right? And so just like the Lord told them to do, when you go to this or that region and preach the word of God and the people there do not receive you, shake the dust from your feet. Don't even carry a part of that land with you as you go because God's judgment will be upon it right and so again it was a warning to them man I won't even let the dust from this ground be found on my on my sandals because God is going to come down hard on this place right and so you know just just remembering how how merciful God was God bringing to fulfillment all the things that he had spoken of through his prophets and these people still resisting the truth, right? And even to this day, right? For those Jewish people who do not receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, it's like, then where's the Messiah that was promised? How long are you going to wait? It's been thousands of years. And you're still waiting for things that God said such a long time ago, instead of just humbling yourselves and coming to realize that 
God kept his promise, right? He sent the one who he, who he mentioned. And he came from your people, okay? And, and still, you, you won't even receive one of your own, right? And so, you know, very awesome stuff we see going on here. Um, you know, just keeping and keeping your remembrance, keep in the forefront of your mind. Be led by the Holy Spirit, right? We all can go about devising our own plans on what we would like to do for the Lord, you know, what things we can do for him. And, and again, there's nothing wrong with that. That's all well and good. Use every talent you have to serve God. But then also get into some deep prayer and fasting to determine if God has a special assignment for you to do. If he set you apart for a particular thing, okay? A very special sacred thing that he has for you to do that really no one else can do. You know what I mean? And, and again, it's not to say that you might um, be more special than anyone knows. We're all uh, special in God's eyes, right? But again, there might be some things that the Holy Spirit gives me insight to that no one else has. And so if I don't bring that to the table, it will never see the light of day, right? Men and women on earth will never get to enjoy those treasures that God has given you, you know? And so if, if there's something that you got that the Holy Spirit wants you to bring, we would love to see it, right? Because we don't want to miss a thing, you know? So keep that in mind. Um, aside from that, uh, we just want to encourage everybody who's looking for discipleship, looking for uh, baptism, you know, looking to take on the Lord's Supper, you know, looking to um, understand what it is when Jesus washed the feet of his disciples, okay? Anybody who lives in our region, who's able to reach out to us. If we're not that far from each other, we'd be more than happy to do these things with you guys. You guys can get in contact with the brothers who are on the social medias um, or contact me if you have my information. And uh, and we would be more than happy and honored to uh, to disciple you and, and do these things that the Lord has taught us to do with each other. You know, so again, so that we can function as a body for the glory of God, all right? And so, again, we thank you for tuning in. Uh, we pray you uh, all the best in the Lord. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance toward you and give you peace. God bless you guys. Scripture, meditating on your scripture. Lord Jesus, open up my mind, open up my mind, meditating on the scripture, meditating on your scripture, something new every single time, and every single time. Blessed are the ones who meditate upon the words of God And the ones who take to heart what is written in them Each one is like a seed, taking its time to grow But at the harvest, the fruit is all of that and then some Every line is full of knowledge and wisdom Helping you to uproot the lies of the system Equipping you for every good work in the kingdom Preparing you and yours for the arrival of his son Scripture, meditating on your scripture Lord Jesus, open up my mind, open up my mind, meditating on the scripture, meditating on your scripture, something new every single time, and every single time. Whenever I read, there's always something new to learn. You open my mind to things that only you discern. Mysteries of your death and resurrection revealed in every section. The text bears your reflection from your infancy to your ascension. From your second coming, even unto eternity with the brethren. See, line for line, you told it all before it happened. Starting from when Eve ate and gave some to Adam. And that's when he made the choice to lay his life down. But you cursed him, sweating his eyes, thorns in the ground. Then you versed him upon the prophecy of the Lord who would sweat blood and be adorned with a crown of thorns. And what that means is that you knew from the beginning that you would trade yourself as an offering for his sinning. And like Adam, you would have to bleed to provide the death of your seed for the life of the bride. Come on, scripture, meditating on your scripture. Lord Jesus, 